service of the word for the third Sunday of Lent, our last recorded service in this current round of the COVID pandemic. I'm sorry that because of the consistory hearing on Thursday, it can't match the presentation standards of last week with its two sets of photo montages, but I still hope there'll be something of interest here. Ironically, with the consistory court still very much in my mind, our theme for today given to us in the church's lectionary is the law. And in our heads, all of us have an image of what the law looks and feels like. Even on Zoom, in last week's hearing, we were still treated to a judge in full wig and gown, the swearing of oaths, when he could remember to administer them, statements, cross-examinations, it was a pretty torrid and bruising experience, especially for those of us quite unfamiliar with such proceedings. John Mortimer's rump hole of the Bailey all looked a lot more jolly and human than the rather spiky and adversarial atmosphere which prevailed on this occasion. Visions traduced, new opportunities dismissed in favour of a burning compulsion to spend as little as possible on the organ. But somehow in the mix, the real issues did emerge. The question of whether due process has been followed over all these last three years, and whether we do indeed have access to the William Lamb Trust as we claimed. I'm afraid we'll have to wait three weeks to see what the final judgment looks like, and then we'll go on from there. For some, of course, the law is a very different thing. Instead of being the forum where opposing views are explored, the law has a long arm and an uncanny ability to catch those who breach society's rules. 
For those who break the law, the judge is not the arbitrator between those who disagree, but the person delegated to dispense justice, which largely means punishment for those who offend, or who are said to have offended. There is another judgment being made in the case of Nazanin Zaghari Radcliffe in Iran, whose five-year jail term is due to end today. And then there are the moral, religious, and ethical codes by which we choose to live, the beliefs which are not imposed on us, but the ones we willingly embrace. Our readings today, the Ten Commandments, and Jesus' clearing of the temple, give us plenty of food for thought. But first, let us call to mind the presence of God wherever we are, thanking him for all that he has given us in this week. Thanking him too for the fellowship of the church, which links us not just with other members of St. James's, but also with our fellow Christians around the world, seeking to be willing to follow his law of love and grace. And so we start with our collect. Lord our God, you gave your people the law to guide and protect them. Send your Holy Spirit, so that filled with wisdom and with love, we may know the path on which to walk, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our reading from the book of Exodus. Then God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children from the iniquity of parents to the third and the fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousand generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You should not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. For six days you should labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You should not do any work, you, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and your mother so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You should not murder, you should not commit adultery, you should not steal, you should not bear false witness against your neighbor, you should not covet, your neighbor's house, you should not covet your neighbor's wife, or male or female slave, or ox, or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Praise to you, O Christ, King of eternal glory. I am the resurrection and the life, says the Lord. Whoever believes in me will never die. Praise to you, O Christ, King of eternal glory. A reading from the Gospel according to John. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, Take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, Seal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will rise it up. The Jews then said, This temple has been under construction for 46 years, and will you rise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Over the last few days, the newspapers have been full of a whole host of stories relating to the Duke and Duchess of Sussex, Harry and Meghan. Some to do with the interview that was held with Oprah Winfrey and headlines like, Oprah interview will confirm America's suspicion that Britain is a land of vile snobs. Others focus on Harry's resentment at the treatment he suffered when he was still a child because the senior royal spent more time and energy on William because he would one day be king. Apparently, in the firm, Harry was termed the spare. Whatever emerges over the next few days, some very deep hurts are going to come under the spotlight. Some will be about fairness, feeling slighted and undervalued. A lot will be to do with some poor communication skills and more on whether the royal family still has a place in modern society and the stresses and strains that that institution places, not just on those who are born into it, but on those who marry in or get caught up in its circle. Princess Diana, apparently, deeply resented when pregnant, having to wait for the Queen to go to bed before she could disappear upstairs. Or so the story goes. One of the reasons, I was told at school, for rules and regulations was that they helped each of us to know exactly what was required of us at every point of the school day, including no eating in the streets and always standing up when the teacher came into the classroom. Rules ensure that we were all well behaved in the same way, but they were also a terrible straitjacket. So when various royals from Princess Anne downwards start to buck the trend, then either new rules get made up, or there is a free-for-all, and the more unconventional, as we're seeing with the Sussexes, get terribly hurt. I was at school in the Beatles area, era, and it's little surprise that out in the real world, beyond the school gates, all kinds of freedoms were beginning to emerge. That decade will forever be remembered as the generation where the young simply tore up the desperately restrictive behaviour rule book. The swinging 60s were for many coterminous with 
liberation in every walk of life. It really was a sea chain worldwide as the old restraints were being abandoned in a quite extraordinary way. A time of change that is probably equal to the coming of the video digital age for today's young people who simply couldn't imagine life without the internet and an iPhone. So one of my questions, in a time of such radical change, both now and in the 1960s, would be, is there still a place for the Ten Commandments? And I hope the answer is yes. Why? Because none of the commandments are concerned with conformity to any one set of rules. What they offer is a way of seeing the world as a series of affirming relationships. The first of these, of course, is our relationship with God. But who is He? Simply the unchanging one, the one who made us, gave us life, and who cares for us now, just as he did the slaves who escaped from Egypt through the Red Sea at the time of Ramesses II. Don't ignore him. Don't take him for granted. Don't imagine anything or anyone can take his place. And don't use his name to swear with, because he doesn't like it any more than you would. God was active then, and he is active now. That's the thrust of the first seven verses and the backdrop for everything else. So what follows? Well, after God, there is you and me. And the commandments say something very healthy about our lifestyles, and in particular, the need not to work all the hours that God made. Choose one day off a week. Give yourself a break, a Sabbath rest. The same advice as you would find in any self-respecting modern-day blog on wellness. If God can take a day off, so can you. And you really should. And so should I. Moving on then, God, you and I, and now other people. First off are your parents, who are as close to you as God. You came from them, and they deserve your respect and your love. They won't be perfect, but what does that matter? They are who they are, and you owe them everything. And the rest of the list of the commandments are in the same vein. If you're going to relate well to other people, then you can't deny them what they need. The ban on murder is just for the extremes. But this seventh commandment is actually about so much more than that. If people are to flourish, then you have no business withholding anything that they need. Food, shelter, education, health, opportunities for study, and the chance to play and be creative. Denying people their human rights comes from this commandment too, because it is looking at the whole person and asking us to make sure we give others all they need to live in the fullest sense. One of Jesus' parables says it in a slightly different way. Who would give their child a stone when they ask for bread? Or a snake if they ask for fish? And we can go on to draw as many parallels as you like. Who would use their economic or political power to stop people eating? who would be so desperate for money that they would be willing to sell arms in the Middle East where innocent women and children would end up by being bombed in Syria or in the Yemen. We can see, too, how the final four commandments all come from the same root, the putting of ourselves before those around us. Abandoning trust because we fancy someone we're not married to. Taking things that aren't ours. Slandering people in an effort to make ourselves feel better. And finally allowing ourselves to be jealous of what other people own. Not a single word in there 
is about conforming to any particular standards of behaviour. No petty conformism or this is the way that we do it. It's all so much deeper, freer, and it works in any setting and in any culture. And the great strength of the Ten Commandments is that they challenge that, well, what have other people got to do with me question. They force me to ask myself, how do these guides apply here where I am? When I am jealous of other people? When do I get to prevent other people having what they need? When do I say too much, end up belittling or gossiping about those around me? If we're serious about trying to work out what God is like, then these Ten Commandments give us plenty of food for thought. They set the standard to recalibrate our moral compass. They are well worth sitting down with occasionally as a way of asking how close we are to God's plan for us. But in what way was Jesus keeping the Ten Commandments when he stormed into the temple, took off his belt and threw out all the stallholders who were apparently minding their own business, selling animals for sacrifice as they'd always done? Didn't Jesus actually lose his temper? And isn't temper a form of putting oneself first? Well, we're not the first people to find this a hard question to answer. We think of Jesus being absolutely perfect in everything. And yet here he is, mad with rage, money spinning in all directions. But why was Jesus in the temple in the first place? And why was he so angry? Because he was being faithful to the Ten Commandments. I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. The corruption in the temple had long overshadowed what the temple was really there for. And Jesus was genuinely and quite properly angry and prepared to stand up against what he knew to be wrong. God first. Honesty first. That was the principle he came to preach. It was righteous anger and on God's behalf. The trouble with so much of the tabloid newspaper attention to the royals is that the skills required to maintain this unique institution barely exist anymore. No one has patience for these kinds of rules and etiquette and manners any longer. They take too much effort and they're largely meaningless. Would that we could put the same amount of effort into the things that really matter, poverty, peace, the care of those here and abroad who need us to stand up for them. Using the Ten Commandments as our guide, can't we approach Sorry, can't we encourage in one another a more righteous anger and leave the tabloids and the spats between the royals to their own devices?
So let us affirm our faith in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Though he was divine, he did not cling to equality with God, but made himself nothing. Taking the form of a slave who was born in human likeness, he humbled himself and was obedient to death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God has raised him on high and given him the name above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every voice proclaim that Jesus Christ is the Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. come to our confession, I think we're all well aware that there are rules and regulations, some of which we need to keep. It's for safety purposes, all kinds of reasons why we should abide by the law. The crucial part of our self-control comes from inside of ourselves. We don't do certain things because we know we hurt others and we're not showing them the love and the respect that they deserve. And so it's this self-control, this grace that God gives us to manage our lives so that we are actually caring for others that is the thing that we seek most in our lives. And so as we make our confession, let us ask for the grace to be willing to abide by the law and the law of love and grace that only God can show us. We pray, Father eternal, giver of light and grace. We have sinned against you and against our neighbour in what we have thought, in what we have said and done, through ignorance, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We have wounded your love and marred your image in us. We are sorry and ashamed and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past, and lead us out from darkness to walk as children of light. Amen. And so may the Lord enrich us with his grace and to nourish us with his blessing. May the Lord defend us in trouble and keep us from all evil. The Lord accept our prayer and absolve us from all our offences, for the sake of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen.
confidence and trust, let us pray to the Father. Lord of law and Lord of love, guide our thoughts and still our minds so that our security comes not from rules and regulations, but from our desire to love you and love one another. Train our hearts to hear what you want from us, and may your never-failing encouragement be with us as we move through each moment of every day. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those called to legal office, for judges and magistrates, probation officers, and those who serve in prisons, in youth custody centres, and in secure units concerned with immigration and deportation. We ask for transparent justice and for the care of those who fear their life chances will never improve. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As we pray for the world and all its needs, we remember the people of the Yemen and the impending threat of famine and the peoples of Hong Kong and Myanmar as democratic freedoms are withdrawn. We especially pray for Nazanin Zaghari Radcliffe as her sentence comes to an end today, praying for her freedom to return to the UK. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our church, for its unity and its thriving, for a shared sense of delight in all that God is doing in so many areas of our common life, for our solidarity with those who are struggling and for the nurture of those coming to faith. Help us, Lord, not to be discouraged in the face of so much that is good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In love, we pray for those who need our prayers, for Christopher Brown, Jennifer Franich, Mariolina and Peter Freeth, Emma Granger, Chris Hyde, Haley Jenkins, John, Kingsley Lewis, John Scott, Charlie Sharp, Lynn Thompson and Melanie Toogood. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Assured of your promise to eternal life, we commend to you the souls of all who have died, remembering especially Carol Saunders to be laid to rest on Wednesday and Sherry Deleur, Ellen Barton, Leonard Cobb, Nick Gale and Lee Tain whose anniversaries fall this week. Rejoicing in the fellowship of Mary, the Mother of God, St. James, St. Peter and all the saints, we commend ourselves and all those for whom we have prayed to God's unfailing love. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. And so to our notices for this week, well, as I said at the very beginning of the service, um, this is our last recorded service. On Wednesday, we are going to have a training session, um, Adam and Sinead and others uh, joining the team from CBA, CABS, who are going to come and show us how all the three cameras work and how we can make that as seamless and as invisible as possible. Uh, looking forward to that very much. And the first time we're going to use it, it will actually be for a funeral here in church um, at one o'clock on Wednesday. So that will be our trial run in a sense for the big service this coming Sunday. Um, I cannot tell you how delighted we are finally to be able to welcome Ava, Ivy and Bella Wilson into the family of the church alongside their parents, Jay and Lucy and their friends and family. This is, if you like, a kind of halfway house. Uh, we're not imagining the place to be packed out um, but we do invite members of the congregation who would like to come and share that service with us. Uh, we'll be delighted to see you if you can actually make it. Um, and so we will have a service of the word, which will be basically uh, a baptism and will last about a half an hour. There'll be songs and music, um, but it won't be a full mass. 
And then the following Sunday, um, we really are looking forward on Mothering Sunday to having services as we know them, and they will be both live with all the uh, normal people involved, but also streamed uh, either live or people can pick them up later on on YouTube. So it's going to be a mixed economy, both and happening um, at the same time. And that will be our pattern for the future. Um, we will have it recorded as well as live. And I'm absolutely delighted that last Sunday there were well over a hundred people um, who watched um, the service of the word. And I do hope that we shall expand our opportunity to share the faith with more people because of the technology. And so a huge thank you to the Richard Cloudsley Trust who've enabled us to put the equipment into church. So that's this coming week. I could say a little bit about the consistory last Thursday, but I'm not going to. I've given some reference to it in the piece earlier on. Um, it was very difficult in lots and lots of ways, and things um, didn't quite go as I planned, inevitably, I think. Being Zoomed, uh, I don't think was very easy either. We didn't get a chance to really to kind of relate to the people who we were talking to. Um, and some bits of information were wrong and uh, they've got to be corrected and we're sending the details off to the Chancellor to make sure that um, he's not misled by some of the things that were printed in the past and not quite verified accurately. But also one or two facts that came out of the consistory which weren't up quite right either. So that's more of um, the consistory. Uh, I hope that very shortly it'll be a thing of the past and we can get on and do the work that we're really called to do. I do ask for your prayers for Nazanin. Um, today is the day when she will be completing five years um, away from her family in Iran. You know the story very well, but we have a terrible sinking feeling that they will impose new penalties on her simply because of the reason she's being kept is because of this great debt that the United Kingdom government um, hasn't settled with the Iranians. So um, please, please do pray for her feel for her in this very tense and difficult time. Um, remember Richard, her husband, Gabriella, their daughter up in Hampstead, um, and so many people who are rooting for them all that she may have the freedom that she deserves. So that's our notices for this week. Thank you so much for sticking with us during this series of um, services. I said last week, I'm going to say it again, thank you to Adam, to Sinead, and to all who have made it technically possible and let's go on being the united family of God here in St. James's, this part of Islington, trying to serve him in lots and lots of diverse ways, open to all the challenges and the opportunities, because we know that he loves us and our lives are so much fuller when we're doing what he wants. So as we come to the end of this series and start again as from next Sunday, I can only wish you, as I always try to do, a very, very Happy week. So our blessing. May Christ give you grace to grow in holiness, to deny yourselves, take up your cross and follow him. And so may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with us now and forever. Amen.